so let's talk about um, the 20th and final season of uh, Keeping Up with the Kardashians. It's really crazy to look back and just to think 20 seasons. That's a long time. Just because we didn't really expect it to go on this long. We just were having fun and we genuinely love filming together as a family. But I think we're all so happy we made it to 20 seasons. Like yeah. genuinely so excited. <laughs> was there broad agreement that it was time? Did everybody, were there any stragglers that didn't want it to end? I think we all went back and forth. We made the decision kind of last minute and kind of quickly. And we just all decided together. We were kind of unanimous and then we all called each other. I remember it was on a weekend and we had till the Monday to decide. And so on the Friday, we were like, okay, we're gonna do this, we're done. And then we went back and Saturday, we all called each other and was like, are we making the right decision? Are you sure we should do this? And we just kept on going back and forth on that. And then we all were like, listen, we're all gonna have to, we're all sentimental. We all really love doing this and we love our, ca our crew so much that I think that was such a huge decision for us because um, we loved seeing them and working with them. And we've, they've been in our lives from season one. So it, um, it was an emotional decision, but we all felt like it was the right decision. So the, the finale uh, takes place in Lake Tahoe and it's like the final family vacation for the show, right? Yeah. And so we, we spoke on the phone, I think just after you guys filmed it in December. And yeah. I remember you saying to me that you were kind of maybe surprised that you weren't more emotional, but that maybe you were, thought you might get emotional when the final interviews happened back in LA. Um, and I just wondered, like, did that moment ever come, that sort of big, you know? Yeah, I think my most emotional time was when we told our crew that we weren't gonna go forward after season 20. That was, to me, the most emotional week. <laughs> I was so drained for literally an entire week after that, just from all the calls and everyone reaching out and having all of that energy. That to me was the most emotional. I think I was also super emotional when my um, audio girl gave me my mic. She gave me my, my mic that I've had and they tracked down with the serial numbers that it was my mic through the first 10 seasons. And then we switched to a different mic that they look identical, I think for the last 10 seasons. But she gave me my original mic that I started with and gave every family member and exactly how it was labeled. They're all labeled with like a, a regular labeler, and it's just really special. It's funny to think about the idea of only only a sort of a reality show star that's been filmed for 20 seasons could like feel sentimental value in a <laughs> <I> microphone. <know. laughs> and like just, just, I mean, even sitting in the chair for the last time, it was emotional. Everything, just I thought, I'm really gonna miss these interviews, I miss all these people, but our crew is family to us, you know? So that I think was the hardest part of letting go of the show, is just knowing that we won't see these people every day. So I started watching this show from the very first episode, because remember I told you that I did not um, uh, watch the show before I interviewed you in 2019 for the first time? Well, I finally went back and watched starting from episode one, and it's, um, it's quite a chore. There's like 290 episodes, and that's not even including uh, all the spinoffs, which is, I think, 10 or 11 of them. Do you, have, do you find re a, like a reason to go back and look at something? Or? I haven't. No. Every once in a while, there'll be a, some reruns on, and I'll flip through it and see the outfits and think it's so funny, or just like loving, reminiscing about the houses that we were in and just the things that we were doing. And I, I love seeing that, but I haven't really gone back and watched. Right. I really see you come to life. Like you find your voice and you find your footing like after a few years. And, yeah. and even the sound of your voice changes. I and know. That's the biggest mystery to me and my <laughs> sisters. We are blown away. It's the thing that has us absolutely blown away. We have no idea what happened to our voices. We have completely different voices. Your, your voice deepens. Yes, uh, all and, of ours do. And it's, but it's sort of more, you're, <laughs> you, it's, it just feels more commanding. You're, and like even, okay, I'm like just that. watching you um, become the person that I met a couple of yeah. years ago. Like, cause in the, it was jarring in the beginning to watch you uh, before, you, you yeah. seem so young to me. Yeah, you know? I was, I was. <laughs> and all of those experiences, I mean, I look back and I think, Oh my God, there's so many embarrassing things that are on TV for the world to see. But then you have to kind of 
just understand that I'm so grateful for also the evolution because I've learned so much. So I'm happy that we were able to be on for so long for people to see that and to see now I can look back and kind of like laugh and, you know, make fun of maybe my outfits or my voice or just even <laughs> where we were emotionally. But we were all so, I think the thing that I'm most proud about, like we were just all in it together, but people can really see that and they can see the evolution. And I'm just so glad that we stuck around long enough for people to get that. And for me to even personally have those experiences. Cause I'm, I used to think before I'm, you know, trying to rush, you know, being a mom and trying to rush all of that. And you see that. And I'm so glad. I remember my dad used to always tell me, wait until you're like early thirties or mid thirties before you have babies. Trust me, just wait. Don't do it in your early twenties or, um, it'll just be the right time. And he was so right. And I always thought about that. Even if my friends or Courtney were having babies so much earlier, I just knew when it finally was my time that it was the right time. And I'm so glad that my kids get this version of me mm -hmm. rather than the 20 something year old version of me. And that makes me um, just proud to see all of that on TV. And one day I can show that back to them if they're ever interested. <laughs> well, it's it's an amazing sort of you. You are a person who likes to archive and save things, and Everything. and you're you know as I, I think you said to me on the phone one day that if you saw how organized I was, you'd freak. Like, um, and the show is an archive in that way. Just to have all of those memories and home videos, like the most well shot home videos, <laughs> continuously for almost 15 years. That's amazing. I grew up with so many home videos. That's why we kind of intertwine them. You see a lot of flashbacks and you see a lot of cuts of us as kids in the show because we just had so much footage of us growing up because that's all my dad did would video everything. And so it's kind of like a continuum of that. One of the things that Cece uh, said to me that I loved was I, I was basically trying to get her to say, Answer, answer the question, why do you think so many millions of people around the world have connected with this family? And she said, well, part of it is that Kim is one of the authors of social media. And I just thought that was such an interesting way mm. to put it, being an author myself, that you sort of wrote the book on it in a way. You know what I mean? Mm. And I wondered how that strikes you and how you see your role in the rise of social media. I wouldn't have looked at it that way but it's interesting to think about it like that. I would definitely say, and I've heard this before, is that I, I've definitely realized how to use social media as a tool to enhance my business and how to use it as a focus group. And I always would take everything that I was working on and put a little piece of it out there on social media to get a reaction, to get that focus group of questions that I needed answer, colors I couldn't pick, scents I couldn't pick. I would always show people a little bit of my design and have them be a part of that world with me and feel, it happened organically, but I realized later it made the fan or the customer feel like they're invested in that product because they helped me pick the color of the bottle. They helped with my decision process along the way. It's not as easy as it looks though. It does look <laughs> very easy on the internet, um, whether it's you know promoting makeup or you know skims or anything that I'm doing. It's a full-time job and it's extremely time consuming and it's not as easy as it may appear to some people. Yeah, it's funny, I interviewed Ashley Graham for Vogue and I followed her around one afternoon when she was interviewing Gail King and before anybody said a single word about anything to do with the interview, they could not stop kibitzing about skims because they'd both gotten um, a package, I think, from you and they were talking about Martha Stewart being so excited about skims and that's kind of how I knew that the whole thing was gonna be kind of huge. <laughs> yes, they get she stopped hand? me at a party. I, I'll never forget it. I'm obsessed with Martha Stewart. So I was walking in New York and I hear like, Kim, Kim, and I turn around and she's like, I just need skims, I love it. And I was like, anything for you. Like, <laughs> it was just such a proud moment that like Martha Stewart wanted skims. Well, I just thought right away, it was like Gail, Ashley, Martha Stewart, like you, you start to see a pattern of like, women of age, different ages, shapes, and sizes that all were really obsessed mm -hmm. right away before it had even started. I got the sweetest 
letter, handwritten letter from Kathy Bates about skims and loving skims. And that made my day. And we have to get her in a campaign. <laughs> I want to do a campaign best. with her. How did you decide that instead of shoes or a full collection of high fashion to do um, shapewear? I always try to see what I'm obsessed with and what's a necessity in my life. And if it's not perfect, how can I try to make something that is? And the one huge gap that I felt like was missing in shapewear was just color range. There was probably one shade of nude, a black, and maybe a darker nude, if that. But it was usually just two tones from every company that I ever saw. It was just one nude that was too light for me and then a black. And so I would take that and put it in the sink and put coffee bags and tea bags and let it sit there and soak and dye it to get it to be a darker shade of nude. And um, I just thought, this doesn't make sense. There's so many different skin tones. If I can't find mine, I know my daughter, when she wants it, she's not gonna be able to find hers. And so we started a line of shapewear and that's, I wanted the company to be really, um, very specific and have really innovative shapewear. I was very specific about my fabric. I must have tried it on for you know a whole year, making sure that we had the perfect fabric. And then by the time I designed loungewear and I really wanted cute stuff that you can wear around the house, because when I come home, I like to be really comfortable. Then the pandemic hit at like our first or second drop of loungewear and we had loungewear designed for the whole next year to drop and it just happened to be the perfect time <laughs> and the perfect storm of everyone just staying home and wanting to just be a lot more comfortable. So it's just, honestly, it's my heart and soul. I love it. You know, there's obviously been brands that I had been a fan of before um, Skims came along, but to me, I never just felt like ever, anything was the way that I would have done it. And so I really started from scratch in my head about the items and the pieces that I really felt like there was a need for. So I love that, you know, people will say like, oh, you made shapewear cool again. And I just, it, it is what it is. Like I need it. I'm never one to shy away from saying things that I wear, you know, under my clothes or give all my girlfriends tips or walk around just in my skims and show people shapewear. So I think that it made people also maybe a younger audience of people to feel comfortable wanting to wear shapewear and wanting to just feel good about themselves no matter how old or young they are. So I was uh, Zooming with my shrink the other day trying to keep uh, my sessions going during the pandemic. And she said a really fascinating thing uh, that I hadn't thought about before, which was that one of the benefits of having stopped living your life for a year uh, many people have found that they can now sort of decide or choose what to put back on their plate. Um, and I'm just sort of curious what you um, are choosing to put back on your plate after all of this. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that this year has been so challenging for so many people, but I also think that this year was a huge cleanse and just a huge opportunity for people to really be grateful for the simple things. And that is a huge, I think, awakening that so many people had. And just who you wanna spend your time with, the people that you'll allow into your home because everything is so scary and everyone's afraid of everything. I mean, just even the amount of time that I know me and all my parent friends have spent with our children has been so beautiful that we get this time. I always try to look at things in the positive way. So. You know, even though it's been such a challenging year, I think it's been a time to regenerate, get creative, spend so much time with family. And just this time that I've been able to spend with my children has been, you know, priceless. And it's been, that part has been so beautiful, just knowing that when we do start to fill our plates back up, I hope that we don't fill them up with things that don't make us happy and I hope that, you know, even the, the work schedule, I used to work nonstop and I would have done anything and everything at all hours and never taken into consideration just slowing down at all. 
I think it's I think it was needed. Yeah, I would love to hear a little bit about what what's yeah. coming up in your life in that regard. Yeah, okay. so I'm still in law school. I have two years left, and so I have two years under my belt, and um, it's you know I'm ramping it up now. So I have about like six hours every day. I actually am not doing an essay and doing this interview instead. So I'm gonna <laughs> have to get up really early tomorrow and write like a two hour essay. I'm really hopeful in that. I'm working on like a handful of cases. I'm also doing a Spotify podcast um, with me and a woman named Lori Rothschild. She's amazing. She's a producer that found Kevin Keith's case, which I believe to be an innocence case um, of a man that's wrongfully convicted for a quadruple homicide and um, really working. He's been in for t over 25 years now. So really working, you know, abolishing the death penalty is like so high on my list. And as I have clients that, you know, have gone through s close situations like Julius Jones, you know, in Oklahoma City that I'm really fighting for, it's just, it really makes you stop and just feel that you can't sit still until they right all of these wrongs. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, and this is the last question, I was on the phone with Lady Gaga's publicist uh, the other day. We somehow decided that there was something punk rock about you, that you're not calculated and that kind of fuck the haters, you know, yeah. and I dare you to look away kind of presence that you have, you know what I mean? And yeah. I just, um, but we, it was an interesting moment of like celebrating something about you that was very specific. Oh, thank you. And I wondered if, you know, there's something punk about you. It's like, I think so. I remember having this conversation with Ricardo Tishi because when I went to my first Met Ball, the theme was punk. And I was like, what is, what is this? What am I gonna wear? I would have done anything to go. Yeah. And he was just like, fuck it, you're punk. Like that's, it is what it is. And I get that. And as I'm, I think more confident in myself, I get that more. And I think punk is just an attitude. It just means that you live your life your way and beat to your own drum. And hopefully that makes people, inspire people to want to do that for themselves. Perfect, perfect ending. Cool. Thanks. Great. Oh my God, so fun. An absolute delight. <laughs> this Whatever is great. you need, I love this talking to you. So I know, I love talking to you too. I could sit here all day. I could do the same thing. I feel the same way.